spit straight crack. Luck, you straight whack. Just last year, you was like Remy, let's do a track. I ain't impressed because you dropped 450 on the New Jersey. I just dropped 450 on the crib in New Jersey. In the realm of hip hop, Remy Ma's rise to stardom was a testament to her exceptional talent and her lyrical dexterity. With her powerful delivery and captivating storytelling, she commanded attention and earned respect of fans and critics alike. However, Remy Ma's journey took a dramatic turn when she found herself entangled in a legal battle that will leave an indelible mark on her career and personal life. Reminis Keone Smith, better known as Remy Ma, was born on May 30, 1980s, in Bronx, New York. She grew up in Castle Hill Projects and had a really tough upbringing. Her mother was locked up for a time and her biological father didn't appear until she was 18. From an early age, Smith was exposed to her family's drug abuse, forcing her to take care of her younger brother and sister. As a way to cope with her problems, she started to write poetry. Despite rough circumstances at home, she was an honorary student at school, and at around the age of 13, she picked up a new skill, which was rapping. To nobody's surprise, all of those experiences led to her write about weighty subjects. Her first song ever recorded was titled Suicide and was written when she was only 13 years old. On the record, she questions her own existence with lines like do you think about dying and why would you take your own life? Remy and her friends started to participate in rap battles around the city, increasing her reputation around the Bronx, but never taking it more seriously or dreaming of making it big in the music industry. She treated rap as a hobby until she was around 17 and finally got her first break. As the legend goes, one day she bumped into one of Big Bun's friends outside of a Bronx grocery store. Knowing that she was an inspiring rapper, he invited her to Pun's place who was living just around the corner. Rightfully so, she was hesitant and decided to take her mom with her. Once she got to his house, they found him on a mattress, wearing nothing but a pair of boxer shorts and getting a massage. Hey, I hear you could rap. Unfazed by the scenery, she wrapped a 24 bar verse for him and despite getting impressed by her talent, he asked whether she wrote the rhymes herself or somebody else was writing for her. Remy was surprised and at the same time insulted. I thought it was the dumbest question on earth. Like what do you mean who writes them? Pun explained to her that some rappers at the time use ghost writers. I was like you're lying. I heard a couple of reference tracks and it really bothered me. I just felt like it was cheating. Impressed by the answer and her way to put together rhymes, he took her under his wing and soon became a mentor to her. He asked for her number and told her that he would call tomorrow. Little did she know that the next day she would indeed receive a phone call from him. He drove to her apartment and asked her to get downstairs. Before she got in his car, Pun asked her, can you braid hair? Confused by the question, she responded with, wait, what? And Pun jokingly said, all black girls know how to braid, get in the car. After a couple of minutes of driving, she asked him where they are going. He said, I got a video shoot and it just so happened that this video shoot was for a music video with him, Fat Joe and Jennifer Lopez. But before appearing on any song, she first needed to know how the game works and show everybody her talent. Despite her good grades, she dropped out of high school to fully pursue a career in music and with Pun as her mentor, the road to success was looking brighter than ever. Soon, Pun began working on a sophomore album, Yeah Baby. He would stay for days at the studio and Remy was present for most of the rap sessions. Occasionally, Pun would make a rhyme for visitors, issuing a one-word command, rap. She listened and learned everything. Basic song structure, the importance of concepts, and a strong chorus became ingrained in her head. According to producer LV, if you're smart, you soak up all that knowledge. And Remy did that every single day. By the time she got on the record, she knew exactly what to do. Pun's idea was to showcase her to the world with the same feeling that he had when he sat in his underwear and heard Remy rap for the first time. Unfortunately, he never got to see how big his prodigy would become because just two months before the album's release, Big Pun passed away on February 7, 2000 due to respiratory failure and a heart attack. Pun was only 28 years old. His second and final album was released on April 4, 2000. Before the world knew as Remy Ma, she went under the name Remy Martin and made her debut on Pun's album on songs like Miss Martin. And you was wrong. After Pun's death, Fadjo replaced his position as a mentor, signing her to his imprint label under SRC and Universal, and also made her a member of Terror Squad. To Pun and Joe, she managed to get a lot of connections and soon was working alongside Big L, Busta Rhymes, R. Kelly, and more. Throughout the next couple of years, she continued to work on her craft by appearing as a feature artist from time to time. Catch you backstage, give me the keys to the escalade. You think you do? Take off the Gucci 
chicks participating in freestyle battles. See, most chicks want to do with a tool like a nightstick. Me, I want a tool with a scope and a nice clip. You know, an M1 or an AR 15, equipped with shell catches, night visions, and M beam plus extra bullets for all the haters. I keep it streets like styles. My flow sick like Jada. But if the squad was the locks, I guess I'd be chic in the background, like suck my all over the beat. And also releasing her own singles like Monster. You know the icky so sticky that you have to choke Her biggest break into the mainstream came on July 27, 2004 When Terror Squad released their second album called True Story Remy not only appeared on more than half of the songs But also had a huge single called Lean Back Lean Back, come on! Hard to the easy, into the wizard My arms stay breezy, the dawn stay fizzy Which helped her to win the best female hip hop artist of 2005 BET Award Everybody started to point eyes at Remy, and soon as her C Records, which housed her squad, told Fejo that they wanted a Remy Ma solo project. While she was more excited than ever, she stayed solid and demanded full creative control. The album was her baby, and she was going to do it the way that she wanted to. After all, the album was titled There's Something About Remy, and so she managed every aspect of the process, from picking beats to brainstorming concepts. She sat with producer Scott Storch in Miami and came up with the idea of Conceited, which would later become one of the singles for the album. She also met with Swiss Beats to concoct with Abba. Because she primarily wrote in the studio, the lyrics are married to the beat and the concept of each song. After a lot of blood, sweat and tears, her debut album There's Something About Remy, based on a true story, was released on February 7, 2006. The album received positive reviews, earning praise for its balance of commercial singles, street bangers and introspective records. Singles like With Abba, Conceited you know I look way too good to be innocent I'm conceited, I got a reason And feel so good yeah. Stop acting crazy, I'ma keep it real See I just need someone that gives me something I can feel Became a major success for Remy Ma But unfortunately, when success was within a hand's reach Things once again turned sour Despite the critical praise, the album tanked Debuting at number 33 on the US Billboard 200 Selling only 35,000 copies in its first week Fingers were pointed afterwards, with a good reason. While her single Watawa was still building momentum, labels started to push her other single, Conceited, which made records cannibalize each other. Remy was frustrated at the way the album was being promoted by Universal and how the label wasn't releasing the right singles. She believed that Universal failed to promote the album or press enough copies. The tensions between her and the label also caused the rift between Ma and Joe. While this already looks like a lot, she eventually was banned from the office and dropped from the label. What should have been a start to an amazing career, unfortunately took a dark turn. On February 13, 2007, during an interview with Billboard, she told that she was working on her second album, Punisher, a title she chose to commemorate her friend and mentor, the late Big Pun, and also revealed that she was in the works on her first album as a part of all-female group alongside female rappers, Shauna and Jackie O. We was like, we in the studio anyway, is throwing us crazy beats, we're being received so well. Three females from three different backgrounds Three different ages, different everything coming together. But once again, none of this saw daylight. More problems followed, and this time, it was way more serious. On July 14, 2007, Remy turned herself into the New York City police in regards to a shooting that took place early that morning outside of Manhattan, Delhi. According to the police, Remy and her friends were leaving a party when suddenly, a verbal confrontation broke out at around 4 a.m. The scuffle was between Remy Ma and her then friend, Makenda Barnes Joseph, who was accused of stealing $3,000 from her. According to Ma, she asked Joseph to hold her purse and claimed that when she retrieved it, $3,000 in cash were missing. As they were leaving, she pulled her Cadillac Escalade up to Barnes's Nissan Maxima. Then she got into her car with a cock gun and tried to grab her purse so she could search it for the cash. They started to go back and forth at each other and as the pair struggled over her purse, Barnes was shot in the abdomen, piercing her colon and hitting her in the rectum. Smith drove away, abandoning her $70,000 Cadillac nearby, and got into a taxi. It didn't take long before the cops identified Smith as a shooter, and the warrant was issued. Smith was charged with assault, criminal possession of a weapon, and attempted murder charges. When it came to the trial, Ma claimed that the gun went off an accident, and she didn't mean to fire at her. Her attorney called a ballistics expert, who testified that Miss Smith had pulled the trigger reflexively during the struggle, adding that police officers are trained to hold their index finger along the barrel of the gun to avoid such accidental shootings during moments of stress. The lawyer also added that she was the victim on that night, by saying, I wonder whether it has actually occurred to you that Remy Smith was a victim that night, a victim of someone reaching into her purse and pulling out about $3,000, and also claimed that this is all one big money grab for Miss Barnes. 
Prosecution scoffed at the idea that Smith had fired the shot by accident, saying, Miss Smith did not call 911 or express shock or sympathy. She only proceeded to look to Makeda's bag. While the gun was never found, and security tapes from inside the club did not show any evidence of any altercations or arguments, the outcome did not look good for Ma. She pleaded not guilty to all the charges. I'm not a menace to society. I'm not a thug. I still have a lot to offer to society. The interesting part about this case is that while the gun was never found, so was the money. Police searched Barnes' purse at the scene, and there was no money found. Ma was also later charged with witness tampering and assault after an incident in August 2007 in which she was accused of inciting several male friends to attack a witness's boyfriend at a nightclub. While these charges were later dropped, Remy was eventually found guilty of assault, weapons, and attempted coercion charges. She was immediately taken into custody, with sentencing set to May 13, 2008. She tried to stay as calm as she could, but eventually broke down in the cell, crying and repeating, my boy, my boy. The boy that she was referring to was her son, who at the time was only 8 years old. During the sentencing, she began with a statement, I'm pleading with you to give me a second chance. I apologize, I apologize, begging for mercy for the sake of my little boy. The victim delivered a letter in which she wrote, I will always be the girl they whisper about. I will always be the girl who got shot by Remy. I don't believe she is really sorry. Even up until last week, Miss Smith was on the radio, still making mockery of this whole situation. Judge Rena Uliver came to a conclusion and ended the car with a following statement. Remy Ma is an extremely angry woman who does not take any responsibility for her actions. She left Miss Barnes seriously wounded in the car, bleeding in the front seat. She does not have any real remorse. On face by Remy's crying, the judge sentenced her to 8 years in prison. Remy Ma began serving her sentence at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women in Bedford Hills, New York, and was expected to be released in 2015. Barnes Joseph underwent several surgeries and also filed an $80 million lawsuit against Ma for damages, pain, and suffering. The case was later settled out of court. While the sentencing for her was devastating, life didn't stop there. She went on to get married to her husband Papoose, appeared in a couple of interviews, and also released a couple of mixtapes, like The BX Files, Jesus Christ, and Blasphemy. After serving 6 out of 8 years sentence, Ma was released from prison on August 1st, 2014. The life of Remy Ma would be best compared to a roller coaster, from the struggles during her childhood forcing her to grow up, to get in recognition as a female rapper from one of the biggest artists at the time, and eventually landing a deal with a label, and only a year later, after making her debut, getting sentenced to 8 years in jail. Life is all about decisions, and on that day, Remy Ma made the decision to confront her friend and shoot at her for as little as $3,000. While nobody should play with your money, spending 8 years of your time, one currency that we cannot buy, for as little as $3,000, is not a wise decision.